the supply chain of a wind turbine is an attack on human rights as well, from China to the Congo to the cobalt mines. Um, it's not just a human rights issue for the people who have to live underneath these things, but it's also a human rights crisis, you know, just in the creation of them. Yeah, absolutely, you're right, and that's my worry as a you know left liberal. <laughs> I'm I'm I, I documented so many conflict areas in in um, in in the development world. And what you see is a lot of conflicts are based on upon oil, you know, the distribution of oil, the prices of oil. So this is a conflict, right? And and we we are starting to manage it better and better. Mm -hmm. Up on top of that, you know, we should not be in the illusion that we will get rid of oil because we need oil for centuries to come. You're back and you're back with a new movie, but I, you might be, because it's so long since I talked to you and that's my fault. Um, why don't you give people a brief um, introduction to yourself because um, you are a very experienced filmmaker. This is definitely not your, your first documentary. It's not your first documentary sort of on the topic of how there are two sides to combating climate change, but let's go back a little and tell everybody um, sort of where you come from. Mm, yeah. Well, I'm an uh, independent documentary uh, maker. Uh, I started in um, 2008 um, covering stories in mainly in development countries. And I made over 50 documentaries in these countries for TV, for NGOs, for, you know, people in the developing world. And, um, and after that, I stopped um, doing it because I, I was asking myself the question, you know, I can continue this until I'm 65, but you know, it doesn't help me any further. And I wanted to make a film which was completely independent. So I financed it by myself and I made a film about climate change, not about climate change. It was about agriculture, but you know, all these wind, film, wind farms were popping up at the meadows of the, of the farmers. So I needed to ask questions about these wind farms. And then you need to start questioning what is climate change? So you're, you know, you dig into the science and, and then, you know, a, quite an interesting story came out, uh, the uncertainty has settled. And then, you know, I sort of rolled out of the old system. I lost my network because I made a film which was controversial and you shouldn't be allowed to make controversial films. So I was, uh, you know, they named me everything you can imagine. And um, after that, I start you know, continuing this spirit of new stories of, you know, hey, there are two stories. Why are we not hearing them on the mainstream news? And I'm coming from the mainstream as well. So I ask that question as a liberal guy who just want to have a lot of perspectives to make up my own mind. And, you know, since then, I made four other documentaries like a trilogy, The Uncertainty is Settled about climate change, Paradigma about, you know, the, the controversial debates we have and, um, and then I made the return to Eden about solutions. When we speak about, you know, the climatic instability, let's put it like that. And, um, you know, and I was on a, on a search for, a, for another story. Um, and then um, I remember it was uh, one year ago, September, and I, I was 20 minutes ahead of the premiere of Return to Eden. And uh, I got an email of Alexander Paul from Sweden and, I'm, I don't know why, but, you know, I read the, I read the first three sentences and I just merely called him and, um, you know, I made a story about it. So uh, I did again and um, Headwind is the name and it came out one and a half week ago. And basically it's a story about a former London banker, Alexander Paul worked, worked for you know, the world's greenest bank, uh, HSBC. Uh, he was idealistically driven. Uh, he financed big wind farms and solar farms, convinced he was sort of saving the planet. But he woke up to the fact that today's green is actually um, pitch black and a ego-driven, corrupt and, and broken system. So he gave up banking and moved with his family to a remote place uh, somewhere in the, in, the, in the northern Sweden forest. And his dream was to go back to nature, start an eco farm and put as, you know, much as distance as he could between his family and the, the um, as he said, the industri industrialization of the nature. So until a wind park was planned at the gates of his paradise garden. Uh, so it's kind of an ironic story, you see. And, and 
he now is challenging these wind farms at court, three of them, that these turbines are not saving anything and the construction companies are lying, cheating to the local community that this wind farm park is boosting economy, you know, but none of the workers companies are actually from Sweden. They're all from Norway, Britain, Germany. So it's not boosting anything. So even the electricity produced of that wind park seems to go to a new Google data center in Finland, thousand kilometers away. And in this story, Alexander and I are sort of visiting stakeholders of wind farms and um, ask them questions. You know, and for me as a rural person, as I was looking through the, like, as I was watching your documentary and looking at the imagery, it feels, it feels very familiar to me. I know you spent some time in Calgary. I'm here in Northern Alberta and the landscape looks very familiar to me as I saw that. And I thought this is something that we as rural people all across, I guess the world, but particularly the Western world, we sort of prickle against all the time where you have a lot of people living downtown in urban centers, feeling bad about their lifestyle and their comfortable first world lifestyle. They feel as though they're destroying the planet. So they want green energy. They just don't understand what that means to the people who don't live in the city. And so to make a bunch of city people feel better, people like me have to live with these ugly, destructive wind turbines. And as is pointed out in, in your documentary, the footprint of a wind farm per the electricity or amount of energy produced is so much greater than a well done compact fossil fuel project that in the end would be a lot cleaner because one of the things that I really enjoyed that you pointed out is the sort of supply chain attached to a wind turbine. You go through um, not only where you know the companies involved in building them and where the electricity goes. So th these poor people in Sweden have to have these ugly wind turbines so that the energy can get sold to Finland so that Google can meet its green energy targets for a data center. And I think that's that's a, a point we'll get to in a second. But you also go through how this is sort of, a, the supply chain of a wind turbine is an attack on human rights as well, from China to the Congo, to the cobalt mines. Um, it's not just a human rights issue for the people who have to live underneath these things, but it's also a human rights crisis you know, just in the creation of them. Yeah, absolutely, you're right, and that's my worry as a you know left liberal. <laughs> I'm I'm I, I documented so many conflict areas in in um, in in the development world, and what you see is a lot of conflicts are based on upon oil. You know, the distribution of oil, the prices of oil. So this is a conflict, right? And and we we are starting to manage it better and better. Mm -hmm. Up on top of that, you know, we should not be in the illusion that we will get rid of oil because we need oil for centuries to come in a lot of products. So that the, these complex, these com, uh, complex conflicts stay. Um, but now, on top of that, we create new kind of conflicts, which are the mineral conflicts. You know, we got the cobalt of. 70% uh, of the world's supply of cobalt, uh, cobalt is you can find them in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, you know, and that's that African country where there is a bloody conflict for generations. So we are continuing to doing that. When you talk about the minerals, the rare earth minerals, uh, over 70% coming from China, uh, with a lot of damage to the environment, social impact, it's poisoning the, the, um, the regions of, you know, refinement of the minerals. So we are creating double trouble by um, embracing that whole new renewable energy project, which is absolutely not benefiting climate whatsoever. It's, it's only, you know, it's only creating more energy and more conflicts. And um, so, so all the conflicts are getting more, much and more complex to solve. I'd like to get access to my show as well as other great TV style shows too, like Ezra's Nightly, Ezra Levant Show, and David Menzies' Friday Night Show, Rebel Roundup. Just go to rebelnews.com 
slash subscribe. That's rebelnews.com slash subscribe.